you interesting and engaging guests uh, so that you can uh, engage and learn and even uh, learn about uh, some new things you might not have known about. Uh, so that's what we hope we'll do tonight. Um, and because it is a networking event, um, we want you to prepare questions, uh, ask questions, not during, but uh, we'll have a Q&A session right after the speaker makes his presentation. And I'm sure he's going to have something that's going to make you think and make you go, hmm. So make sure that you uh, write some questions down and get ready for uh, what I think will be a, a very interesting topic. So without much delay, let me talk to you about um, our speaker tonight, Dr. Gleb Sapersky. He's a thought leader in future proofing and he's internationally known. And what do I mean when I say future proofing? Well, Dr. Gleb specializes in helping forward looking leaders secure their organization's future by forecasting and addressing threats maximizing opportunities, future-proofing, right? Well, in this capacity, he serves as the CEO of the Future Proofing Consultancy, Disaster Avoidance Experts. He also is a best-selling author and is most well-known for his 2019 bestseller, Never Go With Your Gut, How Pioneering Leaders Make the Best Decisions and Avoid Business Disasters. And that one was published by Career Press. He's also wrote the he's he's also the writer of the 2020 bestseller, The Blind Spots Between Us: uh, How to Overcome Unconscious Cognitive Bias and Build Better Relationships, as published by New Harbinger. His groundbreaking thought leadership has really been featured in so many places, over 550 articles, 450 interviews, all in prominent venues. So we're not messing around when we talk about he's the expert. You may recognize some of the places you may have seen him or that I'm gonna mention here, USA Today, Time, Fast Company, CBS News, Fortune, Inc. Magazine, CNBC, and oh, so many more. So Dr. Gleb has well over 20 years of consulting and coaching and training experience. So um, I think you're going to enjoy him. Uh, he's also worked with uh, some of us who are involved in startups. He's worked in startups. Uh, some of us are nonprofit uh, members. He's worked with major nonprofit organizations, Fortune 500 companies, uh, literally from A to Z, and I mean from Affleck to Xerox. So I know that is a long introduction, but I want you to grasp just how, um, how important uh, this topic is and how we have found someone who's really, really um, good at this who can explain so many new concepts and I think that will help us be better project managers and better leaders in our organization. So tonight, please help me welcome, although I know I can't see you, welcome Dr. Gleb as he covers the topic of unconscious bias and I guarantee you're going to learn, learn something new. Dr. Gleb, welcome. Thank you so much, Jeanette. I really appreciate that kind introduction. All right, everyone. So let's talk about how you as project managers can work to defeat unconscious bias. And we'll be talking about emotional and social intelligence. But first we'll talk about unconscious bias and what that is. So we have clear terms, right? Can't have a clear understanding without having clear terms. The first part of the presentation will be about the kind of problems we tend to run into, you tend to run into in your work as project managers regarding unconscious bias. And by unconscious bias, I mean, of course, some bad decision-making we make around people, some bad assumptions. Unconscious bias means that you are somehow, for some reason, you are, without being aware of it, making an incorrect decision, incorrect assessment of some other person. That's what unconscious bias is about, to unpack that. And there are a number of reasons why we tend to do that. So we'll get to that. So unconscious bias and correct assessments, the problems with that is that it leads to bad decisions and problematic consequences. We don't want that. 
<laughs> so in all sorts of situations, that's a problem for you as project managers. We'll talk about what kind of problems there are from unconscious bias. And then that's the first part of the presentation. Second part of the presentation, we'll talk about how you can identify them more specifically in your company, yourself, your team, your organization, and then what steps you can take to address them. So that's the two halves of the presentation. Some examples of unconscious bias, where it comes from, some typical situations where it arises, and then how can you identify it effectively in your context and address it effectively in your context. All right then, without further ado, let's get into the topic itself. Now, when you're talking about decisions, assessments of others, you're often told to be confident. It's important to be confident when you're making your decisions. As a project manager, you have to show confidence when you're trying to hurt the herd all the cats in getting your projects done, get all the stakeholders on the same side, involved, engaged. And of course, you have to make a lot of decisions around setting timelines, deciding on the resources. But right now we're talking more about the kind of decisions you make around people, which are very important decisions. And you have to be confident in your decisions. You're often told that you have to be confident. So I want to ask you about another aspect of an area of life where it's important to be confident in your driving. And Atlanta is well known as a city with not so great driving conditions. And I can, you know, I love right now, I live in Columbus, Ohio, so go Bucks, Buckeyes. But I grew up in New York City, so which is also not known for great driving conditions. And so I want to ask you, are you an above average driver? What do you think of yourself when you, know, you have to show some confidence in the road when you're merging into highways, especially? Do you think of yourself as an above average driver or a below average driver? And we'll answer a poll question. So right now you'll be able to see a poll question on the screen. So please vote whether you consider yourself in the top half of all drivers or in the bottom half of all drivers. Are you in the top half or in the bottom half of all drivers? So you, all of you Atlanta folks in those dangerous driving conditions. All right, so we see that just about 90% of us have voted. So Janetta says, can I have one in the middle? No, sorry, you have to be either in the top half or bottom half. That's how it works. We have only two halves. <laughs> Can't cut yourself in half. This is not oh, the salt one. <laughs> Darn. <laughs> All right. So 95% voted. All right, I'll give you five more seconds for those who haven't made their voice heard. All right, so let's see what happens. How many of you are in the top half and how many of you are in the bottom half? Oh, interesting. So we see that 87% of you are in the top half and 13% of you are in the bottom half. <laughs> well, this is a pretty typical result. And what does this talk about? It talks about confidence. Of course, you know, realistically speaking, 50% of you should be in the top half and 50% of you should be in the bottom half. But the consequences of this poll do show us that people tend to be a little bit too confident for their own good. And so that is a, a bias called the overconfidence bias. We tend to be too confident in our judgments about ourselves as, our drive as drivers. And we tend to be too confident in our judgments of other people when we make judgments, evaluations of them. That is our tendency to be way too confident. And that is a, one of the dangerous judgment errors we make because of the way that our minds are wired. Of course, this is a presentation based on neuroscience, behavioral science, which is my area of expertise. And that the research shows us that we tend to be way too confident whether we're judging other people, oh, how good are they, how bad are they, or we're judging our driving skills or we're judging the projects that we tend to manage. In fact, there's a study showing that when people say they're 100% confident, they're right only about 80% of the time, only 80% of the time. No wonder casinos make so much money. <laughs> so that is a problem for us. It's especially dangerous for those with more expertise and experience and authority. So for those of you who are project managers with more expertise and experience and authority, you will tend to be too com more confident, especially than you should be. And there was an interesting study done on this on doctors. 
So doctors, there was a comparison of doctors who were senior doctors, meaning had a lot of experience in the industry, and those who are just coming out of medical school. They're given the same medical case study to evaluate and diagnose and recommend the treatment. And they made the correct diagnosis and evaluation and recommendation at about the same rate. But the senior doctors were much more confident, overconfident in the quality of their recommendation. So this is a problem, not necessarily being more right, but being more confident. And we have to be very careful that when we're assessing other people, we're, that we're not letting our overconfidence lead us into making bad decisions. So that's the overconfidence bias. And that's one of these dangerous judgment errors that you need to watch out for when you go with your gut. And going with our gut, when people tell us you should be confident, you should go with what you feel, you should follow your heart, you should go with your gut, you should trust your intuition, all of that, of course, it feels very comfortable. It feels good when we're told to trust our heart, follow our gut, you know, and so on, go with our intuition, go with our heart, all of those sorts of things. They feel good. They make us feel good. And that's why gurus like Tony Robbins get paid a lot of money to tell you to be primal, be savage, do what you feel like doing. Or Malcolm Gladwell, who tells you to blink, make your decision in the blink of an eye. That feels good. It's pleasant to us. It's comfortable when people tell us to be confident and go with our gut. But making these sorts of decisions often leads to disasters because we are unconsciously biased without realizing it. We saw how, you know, 87% of you are in the top half, only 13% of you in the, are in the bottom half. That's an example, of course, of how so many folks tend to be unconsciously biased about their own skills, about themselves. Now, if you are not able to evaluate yourself 100% effectively as a driver, how do you, well do you think you'll be able to evaluate other people in their performance as a colleague, business partner with whom you collaborate? That's a difficult thing to do. And we tend to be overconfident about this. Our, we have to understand that our gut has evolved not for the modern world, but for the ancient savanna. So that's the essence of the problem we tend to be very much tribal. That's our intuition, to be tribal, to like people who look like us, who share our values, who share our beliefs, who share our preferences. And that's what we had to do in the ancient savannah to survive. We had to be very tribal. We lived in small tribes of 15 people to 150 people. If we weren't sufficiently tribal, we'd be kicked out of our tribe and then we die. And you know, we're the descendants of those who didn't die. So that's kind of why we are very tribal we're oriented toward people who share our tribal characteristics. And we are also oriented against, hostile toward those who we perceive to be against our tribe, or those who are outside our tribe, who don't share our characteristics, especially those who share the opposite characteristics to our tribe, sort of opposing tribal members. Because if we weren't sufficiently hostile to opposing tribal members in the Savannah environment, they take over our tribe and we die. And again, we are the descendants of those who didn't die. So our gut reaction is to actually be very tribal, make bad decisions about people and be overconfident about these decisions. And this results in these dangerous judgment errors with overconfidence bias being just one of them. And these are called cognitive biases. So if you've heard the term cognitive biases, you will recognize it here. Cognitive biases are the specific ways that our mind is kind of messed up because of our evolutionary heritage and the structure of our brain, just the structure of how we process information. We make a number of mistakes. And these faulty mental patterns, that's the cognitive biases. So that's overconfidence is just one of them. Now, I want to ask you another poll question. So I'm curious whether you ever made a bad decision and looking back, you realize you really had the information you needed to make a better decision, but you didn't make a better decision. I know it happened to me. I hired someone, I actually promoted someone from my company. I run a small consulting, coaching, and training company, disaster avoidance experts that Janetta mentioned, future proofing consultancy. And I promoted someone to be the assistant manager in the company. I thought she'd do a great job, but unfortunately, she did not perform. She was unable to let go of her previous ties to her co-workers and she just kind of micromanaged people. It was not a great fit. It, it was pretty bad. So I made a bad decision and I realized looking back, I really should have known better. So 
please go ahead and vote. I see that just over half of you voted. I'll give you five more seconds if you haven't voted yet. All right. Well, we see overwhelmingly this is the total result. Everyone had this happen to them. So you can understand what I'm talking about. When you look back and you realize you had the information to make a better decision, that's an example of a cognitive bias coming into play very likely. So where your decision-making was flawed because of a faulty mental pattern. All right. Now, so those are cognitive biases. And we'll talk about a couple of examples besides the overconfidence bias so you understand what I mean. Now, the first thing I'm going to talk about is something that probably many of you wondered as I started speaking. Not when you just saw me, I look like a normal uh, white American male, right? But when I started speaking, I obviously have an accent. So lots of folks, when they start speaking, ask me, where are you from? I'll be happy to tell you that. I'm from a small country in Eastern Europe called Moldova. It's a tiny landlocked country. It's so small that it needs an arrow to point out where it is. So it's a <laughs> tiny, tiny country. And this is a country I came from when I was only 10. I was born in 1981. And then my parents came to the United States in 1991 when Moldova was freed from Russian domination. Very glad that they came. And I was especially glad in 1996 because there was a world value survey conducted which showed that out of all the countries evaluated, Moldova was the least happy country in the world. Mm. The least happy country in the world. I have no idea why. It's not war-torn or anything like that. So it's just really unhappy. So I'm, I'm very glad that they left. Mm -hmm. And I settled down in New York City. I think I already mentioned that. I grew up there. It was a very multicultural city, just like Atlanta, cultural melting pot. Very, very diverse. Lots of people, lots of different accents. And my parents taught me to be proud of my cultural heritage. So I chose to keep my accent. I chose to not drop my accent. Many immigrants drop their accents when they come to the United States. They work on it, they can get rid of them. I chose not to, I chose to keep my accent. And that was fine in New York City, but as I left New York City, I lived in Boston, then I went to UNC Chapel Hill for my graduate degree in history of behavioral science. And that's when I found out that my decision was kind of a, unfortunately a dumb decision because I was learning about behavioral science and the psychology and cognitive neuroscience. And something I learned about is called accent discrimination. There's a lot of research showing that people with foreign accents have, are perceived, have a false perception among Americans of being less trustworthy. So mainstream American perception is that those with foreign accents those who don't have a mainstream American accents are less trustworthy. And that's for all sorts of foreign accents. There is only one foreign accent to which this really doesn't apply. And that's the British accent. They still have that cultural imperialism going for them. But in general, this is true. So this is a big problem, of course, from a perspective of making good judgments about people. You know, you might be unconsciously undercounting the value of my words right now without realizing it because of, the, of my accent, right? This is just something that happens to everyone. This is a very intuitive and natural thing to happen. And this leads to a pair of cognitive biases that I want you to be aware of. The halo effect and the horns effect. The halo effect and the horns effect. The horns effect, what's that about? Well, that refers to your perception, our perception, anyone's perception of somebody having little horns a characteristic that you dislike, one that doesn't feel like it's part of your tribe, one that goes in a different direction, opposite to your tribe. So somebody having a foreign accent, somebody having religious beliefs that you don't feel like you are a part of, or political beliefs, skin color, ethnicity, gender, all of these sorts of things, maybe cultural background, all of these sorts of things that are different from you. So you, if you have a negative view of their, one of these characteristics, then you'll dislike their other characteristics and you will downgrade them more than they should be downgraded. So you will have an unconscious negative bias against them. That's the horns effect. The opposite of that is the halo effect. 
It refers to somebody having a little halo on their head. If you like one characteristic of someone, if, for example, you both share an underrepresented accent. So let's say if you are from Atlanta and then you go and you settle down, I don't know, in Boston, let's say, and you both share that Southern Atlanta accent and you meet somebody from Atlanta, then you will have that sort of halo effect toward that person. You will have a strong affiliation sense of them, that they're part of your tribe. Or again, political beliefs, religious beliefs, ethnicity, sexuality, all of these sorts of things, abilities, you will tend to perceive them in a more favorable light than they deserve to be perceived. You will have a positive unconscious bias toward them. It's These are problems, the hail, horns effect and the halo effect, that are especially dangerous for business relationships of all sorts. Now, the business relationships, because of course you're making decisions like who to work with, who to hire, who to promote. Those are big decisions. And of course, you as project managers are deciding how to collaborate with people, how to work with them, how to interact with them. Those are important decisions. So those are sorts of really important decisions that we don't realize we might be unconsciously biased about. And that's something we really need to address. And so I will give you an example of how this works in hiring. And this was from a conference I spoke at before the pandemic when we were still seeing each other in person. I, at the time, I was still a professor at Ohio State. And so I was talking about the hiring people. And this was a closing keynote at Horaco, which is the HR conference for Central Ohio. It's the HR group for Central Ohio. And this was the regional conference, their annual conference on diversity and inclusion. So there are over 100 people in the room talking about diversity and inclusion. Diversity and inclusion experts, leaders at local organizations, prominent organizations like Nationwide and so on. So that's, well, that's what's happening. And something you need to know if you don't know that Columbus, Ohio is the home of the Ohio State Buckeyes. So go Bucks. It's really people are big, big fans of this college football team from Ohio State over here. And our big opponents are the University of Michigan Wolverines up north. And so I'm asking folks in this presentation whether they would hire a University of Michigan fan or not. Now I will share my screen so you'll see what I'm talking about. All right. So as you know, I'm a professor at Ohio State. I'm contractually obligated to root for the Buckeyes. <laughs> I'm guessing there are a lot of Buckeyes fans here, you know. Go Bucks, right? Yo, oh, there you go. Now, how likely are you to hire a Michigan fan? See, free people. So there are free people in a room out of 100, over 100 diversity inclusion experts who would be willing to hire a University of Michigan fan. And again, these are HR experts at the diversity inclusion conference. This is the closing keynote. And this is, there are only free who would be willing to hire a University of Michigan fan. Now, regardless of how we feel about Michigan fans and their poor, poor choices, <laughs> <laughs> in which team to root for, does that indicate anything about their performance as an employee? No, I know. Come on, that no should be stronger. <laughs> as you can see, I gave them a chance to change their mind and they were not interested in changing their mind. <laughs> so this is something that is a big problem. Big, big problem. The halo effect and the horns effect and it causes both unconscious bias, negative unconscious bias, the horns effect in this direction toward University of Michigan fans. And again, this is something that's, you know, this is sports. This is not something fundamental like religion, ethnicity, skin color. This is sports, which team you're rooting for. But this already is causing a big, big impact. And of course, these people are, would be much more likely to hire someone from the Ohio State than they should be for the same reasons. So this is a serious, serious problem that we need to be addressing and thinking about how to address. All right, let's do a poll. And I want to ask you whether 
learning about the halo and horns effect, do you think it would be valuable for you and your team to investigate and address any negative impacts from this, from the halo effect or in the horns effect in your team and your organization? So please go ahead and vote on that. And while folks are voting, I'll uh, answer Geza's question on uh, the question was, these effects seem to be subjective, how something like this measured objectively, where it becomes dangerous for business. It's actually pretty easy to measure objectively. When I do consulting on this, it's what I what we do is we simply measure and evaluate the kind of people that are being hired and promoted based on various categories. And it's pretty clear when you look at the data to see the whether people are being hired, promoted, evaluated fairly or, unfairly, or, or unfairly. So that's one thing about looking at the data. The other thing about is about people's perceptions. So you can ask people within the organization, I will give you an assessment later in this presentation, which you can use to see how people perceive things. Are people being evaluated fairly or unfairly in the organization? And that will of course give you very important data about people's perceptions. People's perceptions, of course, fundamentally shape reality. If people perceive things to be unfairly evaluated, then they're likely to be unfairly evaluated. Nicole said that she used the same, uh, same dynamic. Well, there you go. You understand what I mean. <laughs> and yes, Janetta says that addressing the hail and horns effect would make people a little uncomfortable, of course. Unconscious bias makes people uncomfortable. Pointing out to people that you know they are overconfident about their driving makes them uncomfortable. I made many of you perhaps a little uncomfortable in the beginning of this presentation. Talking about unconscious bias is something that makes people uncomfortable, of course. So this is something you have to realize and be prepared for. You know, not come to the room expecting just everything to be hunky dory and rainbows and unicorns. This is something that's a serious subject because talking about how you have faulty mental patterns is a pro is a challenging topic. All right, so I see that the large majority of you voted. I'll end the polling. Okay, so we see overwhelmingly that for 95% of you, this would be valuable to address the hail and horns effect. So glad to hear that. So now that you know about the hail and horns effect, and I'll send you some information about this after the presentation, what you'll want to do is the 95% of you who think it is valuable to address it, you'll want to take this information back to your team and start working on addressing this issue. Inform them, talk about them, say, talk about how you attended this presentation and that how it will be valuable from your perspective to address it. And a good start will be an assessment that I'll share with you later in the presentation. So Doug asks if behavioral interviewing the technique to overcome unconscious biases, it can be depending on how you do it. So it really depends on the specifics of behavioral interviewing. There are certain aspects of behavioral interviewing that are supported by research, certain aspects that are not. So I'm not gonna go into during the presentation, we can talk about it later, but there are some ways of addressing unconscious bias through interviewing that's effective. And the, the effect of the most effective kind of very briefly approach to interviewing has been shown to be structured interviewing, where what you do is you have a series of questions and you ask each interviewer, in, you ask each interviewee the same questions. And of course, you can ask follow-up questions within the question, but you ask them all the same questions and you rate them all on the same questions. That is a way that helps address unconscious bias. So that within kind of structured interviews. All right, let's go on and talk about another pair of cognitive biases that is important to address, the optimism bias and the pessimism bias. Optimism bias and the pessimism bias. Now, when we think about unconscious bias, we tend to think about categories, typical categories of discrimination, ethnicity, skin color, all the, the ability, all the protected categories, but there are other categories. And this is one reason I brought up accent discrimination and I brought up the 
Ohio State versus Michigan rivalry, because we don't typically think of these things as discriminatory, unconscious bias moments, but they very much are, and they impact us in ways that we don't realize toward other people. And here is another dynamic that is very important to realize that impacts us powerfully, but we don't typically think about it within the context of unconscious bias. The optimism bias and the pessimism bias. Oh, this refers to people, optimism bias refers to people who are very optimistic about the future. And that's, I, I'm a person like that, I'll be honest about this. I tend to see the future as bright, as full of hope, full of opportunity. I'm very creative and entrepreneurial person. I have 20 ideas before breakfast and it feels like they're all brilliant. And this is something that, so that's me. Unfortunately, I am too risk blind. And so are other folks who tend to be more optimistic. The opposite bias is the pessimism bias. And they exist on a spectrum. So there's kind of an extreme optimism and extreme pessimism and people tend to be somewhere in the middle. I'm pretty, I'm, Pretty ex not extreme optimism, but you know, close to it, more than a moderate optimist. <laughs> and the pessimism bias describes people who are the opposite of optimists. They tend to be risk avoidant. They tend to see the world as more hostile and more full of threats. So they're great at managing threats, at stabilizing things, at improving things, but they tend to be too risk averse. So you'll see the project managers tend to be more pessimistic than optimistic. And far from all of them, certainly there are plenty of optimistically oriented project managers, but more project managers tend to be pessimistic than optimistic. So in companies, you'll see that there are various functions which tend to attract people who are optimistic and various functions which tend to attract people who are pessimistic. Functions like project manager, like you know, someone who's in accounting, like someone who's in finance, of many HR positions, definitely legal, tend to attract people who are pessimistic, these control functions, these manage functions, the operations people. Then people who are in more creative positions like R&D, sales, and so on, of, would tend to be people who are more optimistic. And so that is a division that you'll often see in companies that causes a lot of tension. Really what you find when you look at the research is that you need at least two people of each type. So if you have on your team, you need both. You can't have a good team that's made up of only optimists or only pessimists if you want the team to function fully creatively and to have new ideas and be creative as well as make sure to make good decisions and not have too many wild ideas. Now, it's very tempting for me to work with only with other optimists, to not have pessimists on my team. So I have a, run a six people company called Disaster Avoids Experts, mentioned that already, consulting, coaching, training, and future-proofing. And imagine what would happen if I only hired other optimists. I click with them well. We work really well together. You know, They reinforce my ideas, I reinforce their ideas, I praise their ideas, they praise my ideas. It's great. But imagine if we had all people on my team, if they all had 20 ideas before breakfast and if they thought they were all brilliant and if they all reinforced positively each other's ideas, well, then we'd be running in 120 different directions. And you know, that's not how you get projects done. That's, that's how businesses fail. That's not great. What is very important for me, for my team, is for me to make sure to bring on some pessimists on my team. So I make sure to hire some pessimists and I give them my 20 so-called brilliant ideas. And they say, well, these are all half-baked potatoes, but maybe these three are worth finishing baking. And then they'll take these 17 idea, these 20 ideas, discard 17, take those three ideas that are left that are decent ideas, and then they'll improve them because they're great at improving things. They look at the flaws and they fix the flaws and then they're great at implementing. And so they implement the ideas effectively. And so that is where you need both optimists and pessimists on the team. Optimists are going to be generating, creating these ideas and uplifting people, pushing them forward. Pessimists are going to be holding down the bricks, making sure that bad ideas don't get through and managing the process as it goes along. And you'll see often in companies, lots of tensions between people who are more optimistically inclined, who tend to see pessimists as just Mr. No or Mrs. No, and pessimists who tend to see optimists as just shooting from the hip. That's a bad dynamic. That is not the way that you should collaborate. And you have a lot of hostility, some horns effects between optimists and pessimists. And that's a problem. And you really want, you want to do is 
what I uh, talked about before, where you have optimists generating ideas and pessimists evaluating them and implementing them effectively. All right, so let's take a look and do another poll. I'm curious if you think it will be valuable for you and your team to investigate and address any negative impacts from this optimism bias or pessimism bias. Please go ahead and vote. Yeah, so Janata said that it's her, her experience that helps her understand the importance of opposites balancing each other out. Good, yes, that, that is really definitely important. Good. I see that four fifths of you voted, so I'll give you five more seconds for those who didn't vote yet. All right, great. So we see that 96% of you believe that it would be valuable. And that's excellent. I'm glad to hear that. So I'll give, again, give you an assessment, give you more resources about this at the end of the presentation. I'll send them to you by email. And then you can bring this information to your teams in the same way that you'll be bringing information about the halo effect and the horns effect and the overconfidence bias. Great. All right, so this the part of the presentation. This was the part of the presentation about learning about these unconscious biases, identifying them. Now let's talk a little bit about addressing them more specifically. To overcome these dangerous judgment errors, what do you do? You need to teach yourself and teach others on your team to go against your intuitions, to go against your heart, to go against your gut, whatever you call it, against your emotions. Our intuitions are great for helping humans survive in the savanna environment because of the threats they faced were immediate, intense, in the moment threats. But in the, today's world, these are not the kind of decisions we're making. These are, we are not facing intense, immediate, in the moment threats. And you can see that in a number of areas, you've already took, taken steps to address some problematic to, tendencies from the Savannah environment. For example, in the Savannah environment, when you came across a source of food, a source of sugar, it was very important for you to eat as much of it as possible. Bananas, honey, apples, all of that sort of stuff. You need to eat as much of it as possible to survive and thrive. And we are the descendants of those who ate as much as possible and we survived and thrived and reproduced. Well, guess what? In the modern world, that's not so healthy because food companies make a lot of processed food that triggers that sugar impulse and we eat way too much for our own good. Now imagine that you know, that prior to the pandemic times, you came into the break room and some grateful vendors send over a box of dozen donuts. And it's there tempting chocolate glazed donuts and you decide you'll take half a donut. Well, then once you take half a donut, you're like, well, I don't want to leave half a donut for somebody else. So you take the other half and then you're really triggered by the sugar. So you take another donut and a third donut. And before you know it, half the box is gone. <laughs> Not that it ever happened to me, right? This is a very common tendency for us to be triggered by sugar. And hopefully you figured out some ways for yourself to manage that in the modern world. It's really important. I mean, we have the obesity epidemic in this country, but we've been learning more and more over time with research showing how to manage this obesity epidemic. For example, to choose healthier habits, like passing by that box of donuts and going instead for the bowl of fruit that another grateful vendor sent over. So that's a much, much healthier option. And that is hopefully something, the kind of thing that you've worked on to manage your physical health in the modern world, whether it's eating healthy fruit or going and or doing exercise and all of that sort of stuff, which is unintuitive and perhaps uncomfortable, but is very important in order for, for us to have great physical health in the modern world. In the same way, it's really important for us to change our intuitions in a way that's uncomfortable. You know, it's uncomfortable to choose not to eat those donuts. You have to really go, you have to use your willpower to not do it. In the same way, you have to use your willpower to change your eating habits and to change your the way that you use it to change your eating habits. You have to use it to change your thinking and feeling habits in order to make good judgments about people. You know, and by now, hopefully, many of you have developed healthier habits, you know, like eating, choosing to eat salad or fruit, like I said. But you know, no one is born liking salad. Babies are born liking sweets, candies, donuts, all of that sort of stuff. So we have to go against 
that sort of primal savage instinct that Tony Robbins tells us to be primal, be savage. No, don't be primal. Don't be savage, be civilized instead and choose the habits and the mental thought patterns and feeling patterns that will help you make the best decisions about your physical health and mental health, mental fitness in order to make good decisions about other people. And to do that, you need to have great emotional intelligence and social intelligence. You need to improve both of these areas. So what's emotional intelligence and social intelligence? Emotional intelligence has to do with yourself, your self-awareness of yourself, what's going on within you, your emotions, your ability and your awareness to manage your emotions. That's what it's about. Your emotions, your intuitions, your gut reactions, all of that, your heart. That's what emotional intelligence is about. Your ability to manage, to be aware of and to manage yourself. So that's one part of things. That's about your own you know, unconscious bias within you. Then social intelligence is about other people. It's about your ability to be aware of other people and your ability to influence them, their relationships with each other, with, to you, their emotions. That's what social intelligence is about. So these are two distinct skill sets. Emotional intelligence is about you. Social intelligence is about other people. And in order to address unconscious bias within yourself, you need emotional intelligence. In order to address it within other people, you need social intelligence. Now I'm going to ask you another polling question. And I'm be curious to learn whether you think it will be valuable for you and your team to develop further your emotional intelligence and your social intelligence. So please go ahead and vote on that. Okay, see that nearly three quarters of you voted. So I'll give you five more seconds. Okay, great. So it's clear that the vast majority of you do believe it will be valuable. And I'm very glad to hear that. So this is information that you will be developing yourself. This is not something you necessarily want to take back to your team. This is something for you to know. And this is something you'll be working on within yourself to develop your emotional intelligence and social intelligence, and also within yourself to, so to, in order to make good decisions by yourself to address unconscious bias within yourself, and also to help other folks make better decisions through social intelligence. All right, so how can you identify these unconscious biases within yourself, within other people? Let's focus on the whole team, the whole organization, your workplace as a whole. There is an assessment that I promised to share with you, and I'll be talking about that right now, an assessment on dangerous judgment errors in the workplace. This focuses on the 30 most dangerous judgment errors in the workplace. There are over 100 cognitive biases altogether that are available. You can take a look at the list of cognitive biases in Wikipedia if you're curious to learn more about all of them. But there are 30 of them that are most dangerous, most problematic for professional settings, and I gathered them all together in an assessment. And what that helps you do is evaluate how widely present they are in your in workplace and how impactful they are in your workplace. So that's what the assessment is about. And then it gives you the next steps for addressing them. So that is the goal of the assessment. And I'll share the assessment with you right now so you can check it out. You should be able to see the assessment. Descriptions of the directions. So check, take a look at the directions. Now, the questions don't ask folks whether, you know, how much con overconfidence bias there might be in the workplace or how halo effect or horns effect. It asks about a specific behavior, about specific problems that occur in your workplace. So the answer for each question will be in percentage terms out of all the possible times the problem might have occurred and uh, over the past year. So if you'll be doing the assessment, you can focus it on a specific department, team, group, or your whole organization as a whole. So don't overthink it. You really wanna go with your initial impressions. Each question should take you no more than 15 to 20 seconds. I want you to open the chat feature because we'll be using it right now. So open the chat feature. We'll be using it to answer the questions. All right. So let's go with this question. Question six, 
when a potential or current employee was evaluated, in what percentage of the situations was the evaluation too positive due to factors not relevant to their job competency or organizational fit? So please go ahead and answer in percentage terms over the last year. Somebody was evaluated. How often was the evaluation not, was the evaluation too positive due to factors not relevant to their job competency or organizational fit? Okay, so let's see. Oh, somebody accidentally annotated it. No worries. So we have 50%, 10%, 20%, 80%, 35%, 0%, 70%, 40%, 60%, 75%, 80 So a wide range, clearly. So this is clearly happens as a problem in some cases. And we're in an organization where it's 10 to 20%, it's really not a big deal. It's, you know, it happens. If it's going into the 20 to 30% range, that becomes more of a serious problem. If it's getting into more than the 30%, that becomes pretty serious problem. Of course, this has to do with the halo effect. So this is a very clear problem when it's getting into high numbers, because if people are being unfairly evaluated too positively, then that's going to cause a lot of problems for the right making sure that you're hiring the right people, promoting the right people, have the right people working in the organization. All right, let's go with another question, number three. Think about all the significant decisions. In what percentage of cases was someone overconfident about their decision? Please go ahead and check. 100% for someone, 80%. 70%, 50%, 65, 20, 95, 30, 75, 75, 50%, 5%. So again, a very wide range. And the same logic applies. 10 to 20%, it's not a big deal. 20 to 30, it's becoming more of a moderately issue. If it's getting 30 and above that, that's becoming more of a serious issue. Because if you're overconfident about your decisions, then you're not changing your mind when a new evidence presents itself that should show itself to, that you should change your mind and you're arguing too strongly for your decisions, you're making bad decisions. This is a problem. So this, these are two examples of questions that you'll see in this assessment and all the other questions are similar in that regard. So somebody asked earlier about how do you get effective information about the, the quantitative information, non-subjective information. This is a great way to do so. So what I strongly recommend is that you use the assessment as a way of addressing cognitive biases in your organization. What That's a sub, very simple and very clear and very easy way that you can immediately bring this to your team. You can share this with them. You could say, hey, I think this is a useful tool that we should all take. How about we all take this assessment? and see what the answers are for everyone. And then of course you discuss it. After you see what the answers are for everyone, you discuss it and have a discussion. And as a result of the discussion, you could see what are the next steps that you want to target, whether the overconfidence bias, the halo effect, horns effect, or many others that are again, 30 of these dangerous judgment errors that you want to address. Now, given that, do you think it will be valuable for you and your team to take this assessment and address the cognitive biases it uncovers? Please go ahead and vote. See about just over half of you voted. I'll give you five more seconds. All right, great. So we see that over 90% of you would find it valuable. That's great. And I'll send it up to everyone after the presentation and then you can go ahead and you can take the assessment yourself and then share it with others or share it right away with the others and then have folks take the assessment together 
and address any of the cognitive biases it uncovers. Excellent. Then the final thing that I wanted to share with you are questions that you can use to address these cognitive biases. The one part of addressing cognitive biases, of course, is awareness. The assessment is getting awareness. Another one is making good decisions once you have this awareness. And even before you have this awareness, this will still help address some of the cognitive biases. This is a really effective technique for making quick decisions or making good enough decisions. Let me say it this way. It's a quick technique that is excellent for making good enough decisions where you don't need a decision that's perfect. You know, if you're hiring the CEO of your company, this is not the technique that you would use. But if you're hiring kind of a moderate level employee, this is a good technique to use. If you're deciding who needs to participate in a project as your project managers, who, need, who are your stakeholders, who needs to participate in the project, who maybe should be left out of the team, who are going to, who needs to do various tasks, how the project should go, all of these sorts of questions, people relevant and not people relevant. You want to ask these five questions in order to avoid decision disaster and make a good enough decision. This is a very quick technique. So first, what important information didn't I yet fully consider? This question has two important components. One is important information. Important information means that you don't want to consider all the information. You don't want to get stuck in analysis paralysis. That would be, that's a trap. You don't want to fall into that trap. So think about what information is important before you dive into the question. Then the other important part of this question is fully consider. We tend to not consider fully information that goes against our intuition, that goes against our beliefs. That, so you want to consider information that goes against your intuition, goes against your preferred answer, against your desired choice, much more strongly than you consider information that goes forward because you'll naturally weigh that information that goes forward more heavily. So you'll want to give more weight to information that goes against your preferred option. If you can't prove that you're wrong, that's great. The, but if you can prove that you're wrong, that's great too, because then you don't make a bad decision. Next, what dangerous judgment errors haven't I yet fully addressed? So you want to learn about yourself. Are you optimistic or are you pessimistic? Maybe there are some halo and horns effect situations going on here. What kind of overconfidence issues might be going on? And various other cognitive biases. And again, I'll share with you resources for how you can learn about these cognitive biases. You want to think about which of these dangerous judgment errors you didn't address yet. Next, what would a trusted and objective advisor suggest I do? So perhaps someone who is a fellow member of your PMI group, the Atlanta chapter who you trust, who's a respected colleague, maybe someone who's a coach or consultant that you have, or maybe someone who is a mentor in your organization, maybe someone who was a mentor when you were growing in your career. What would that person tell you to do? What would that angel on your shoulder tell you to do? You would get about 50% of the benefit from this question the research shows just by asking, taking yourself outside of yourself, asking what would you tell a trusted friend to do in this situation? And we get the other 50% of the benefit by, ask, by actually going to our trusted objective advisor. So I would go to someone who's a pessimist and get their feedback on important questions that I don't want to screw up. Next, how have I addressed all the ways this could fail? So think about the ways this decision can go wrong. If you're thinking about including someone on the project management team for a certain project, think about ways it could go wrong. If this is the person you include instead of somebody else who can do the things that this person can do. You know, maybe this person has some tensions with others in the group. Maybe they tend to be too domineering or something like that. So think about the tensions that can come, the issues that can come. And of course, there can be problems if you exclude this person too. So you wanna be thinking about these issues and think about all of the ways it can go wrong as you're thinking of making the decision. Finally, what new information caused me to revisit this decision? What would cause you to change your mind about the decision? Let's say you're writing an important email to someone about the project that you're managing. Now, you could say something like, hey, if I don't hear back from this person in three days, I'll give this person a call. That gives you a very clear timeline that would revisit your decision and revise and change things. If you don't have a timeline, you're kind of waiting, you're anxious, you're wondering why that person isn't responding, if you think that they should respond. But if you do have a timeline, you're very confident about what you're doing. You're waiting for three days and then you're giving that person a call. So these five questions, the five questions to avoid decision disasters 
are a great technique to help you make sure that you make good enough decisions about other people and about other aspects of any project that you're managing and any other sort of decision that you don't want to screw up. All right, so with this question, let's do a last poll. Would it be valuable, do you think, for you and your team to use the five questions to avoid decision disasters technique to make good enough decisions? Please go ahead and vote. See that just over half of you voted. Let's give 10 more seconds to let other people have their voice heard. All right. Okay, so this seems to be a especially popular one. Over 98%, 98% of you would like to use this technique. And I'll send to all of you the decision aid that you can use for this technique. So great to see that. All right then. Now, the resources that I'll send you by email after the presentation, these will be free additional resources. You'll have an assessment on dangerous judgment errors in the workplace, the one I showed you before, the decision aid on these five key questions to avoid decision disasters, sample chapters from my best-selling book on this topic, the blind spots between us, how to overcome unconscious cognitive bias and build better relationships. And then you'll have an opportunity for a coaching session. I have free open slots. It's first come, first serve. So you'll get an email with a link that you can use to schedule a coaching session. If you click on the link and if it still works, that means that the free slots have not yet been taken. And so I'll send that either later tonight or tomorrow, probably tomorrow morning. So check out your emails tomorrow morning. You'll see that in your email and you'll be able to schedule the coaching slot. Make sure to schedule it quickly because other people will want coaching too. All right then. And that's the end of the presentation. I hope you've enjoyed it and I'll be taking any questions right now. You can put them in the chat or you can unmute yourself and we can ask questions that way. Please go ahead. Well, uh, Dr. Gleb, I want to thank you for um, sharing that information. It was really, really interesting. Uh, I enjoyed it. And um, I would like uh, to ask a question, but um, I would like uh, you guys who would like to ask questions, feel free to do so. You can either take yourself off the mic and or place it in the chat. Um, but um, this is um, an opportunity and a safe space to, you know, engage and ask things that uh, you may not have uh, had an opportunity to do before. So, um, you know, you talked a lot about um, uh, really uh, quite a few things. Uh, first, my first comment is that I did not realize there were so many um, biases. You said here's 30, like, like, oh, 30 of maybe 500, like there's so many more. <laughs> but um, I didn't realize there were so many. And, um, and, and even the one you gave in the beginning about the accent bias, I think I, I, I feel that that one is uh, prevalent. I mean, I think people do have that. Um, and they, I don't even know if they, they do it um, sometimes jokingly, but they do it like it's, it happens. Yep. So um, what I, but one of the things you talked about was uh, social and emotional intelligence. And that's something we talked about in, in my uh, company. Um, we've been training um, the employees on emotional intelligence. Mm -hmm. But I'd like to get your thoughts on what are some of the ways you can learn to be better at social and emotional intelligence, especially mm -hmm. if you're not realizing those things about yourself that could be issues anyway. The, what the research shows about getting better, first of all, at emotional intelligence. So since you're saying you're training people on that, people generally think that they're good at emotional intelligence. They think they know about themselves and so on. So you need to start by showing them that they're wrong. And that's why I started with the poll around the driving <laughs> and the confidence <laughs> about the driving, right? So that's an easy, safe way. You know, no one is especially offended by being, you know, overconfident about their driving, right? It's not a job. It's not a job-related skill. It's not something you know, perceived. It provides pretty good psychological safety for folks. 
but you need to show people that their assessments of themselves are wrong and that they are making mistakes around their self-assessment, how good they are at emotional intelligence. That's why I also did in the presentation about the Ohio State Buckeyes and University of Michigan fans to Krakow. That was a safe topic to talk about because everyone in that room is not fans of Michigan. <laughs> and so they can understand that. And so that's again, sort of a safe topic. So thinking about safe topics that people can gather around and realize, okay, I'm mistaken about this. What else am I mistaken about? Mm -hmm. That's the first step to really changing, because if you don't think you have a problem, no matter how much training you do, people will not get it <laughs> and they will not care. So mm -hmm. that's the first thing you want to really be doing. That, that's for emotional intelligence. For social intelligence, you want to show people that they're wrong about others. So there's, you know, with the people in the room, and there are many ways of doing that. You can ask people in the room to do things like evaluate what Every, what other people in the room think about a certain topic. And let's say, how many of them have this opinion versus that opinion about a something? And then you can poll the room and see what actually happens and see how close they are and calibrate on that and show that many people tend to be off. The, what, you, what you'll tend to find is that they run into what's called the false consensus effect. That's one of the cognitive biases when we think that people who are in our group generally people who are employed in the same company, share the same beliefs that we do. And that's really much less common than we tend to think. So you can see that going on as well. So those are ways that I would start those conversations. You really wanna start by getting people emotionally invested because what tends to happen is that if people are just presented with this as a training without caring about the topic, without being emotionally invested in the topic, then they'll just not really be into it. They, they won't care so much about the result. And if you don't have an emotional investment, then they will not really get the training. They will not get the benefit of it. You want to get people caring about the topic, and then they will want to learn about it versus just kind of, you know, taking it in as information rather than taking it in as, this is really something I need to change and work on myself. Because working on yourself, changing yourself is a complex thing. It's not easy. It's growth, personal growth. And emotional intelligence and social intelligence is a really complex, challenging thing to grow because you need to admit that you're not uh, as great at being self-aware and as other aware as you tend to think you are. That's a tough thing to admit. So that's the first thing to work on that. So. Absolutely. So um, we have some, uh, some things that are being put in the chat. Um, mm -hmm. um, who would like to talk through that from my group? Oh, I'll be happy to, okay. to do that. So I can see that Jocelyn asked that you are mentioning not, not to be tribal and use our guts. Does this mean to make decisions with our heads and not with our hearts? Yes, you absolutely want to make the final decision with your head. You, your gut, your intuition can suggest certain directions, but you never want to trust it because your intuition can often lie to you as with accents, as with your confidence or lack of confidence. So certainly your intuition can suggest certain directions. And sometimes your intuition will be right. And sometimes it will be wrong, but you can't simply trust it. So the final decision, you should always check with your head before going with your gut. And if they disagree, you should go with your head. Your head is much more likely to be correct. It will not always be correct, but probability is it will be much more likely to be correct on these sorts of questions. To that point, you um, yes. you mentioned earlier an, an example with structured interviewing. Yes. That is um, a way to take the intuition out. Mm -hmm. I like that idea because what you're trying to get the, um, get the teams and the people to do is to use a technique or a tool that will help them give a quantitative assessment to whatever the decision is. Exactly right. Absolutely, yes. So you're going much more quantitative and you're more objectively comparing the candidates. Yep, exactly. All right, Monica asks, when transitioning to a new PM role in an entirely different part of the organization, what's your top three advice points for as you are doing meet and greets to make and receive first impressions and start building productive relationships? I think one of the things you want to look at is what are your initial impressions of this other person and where might they be wrong or right? You want to look at where they have certain affiliations that you feel you share and that you feel you don't share. So what might be 
halo effects and the horns effects you experience toward that other person. And that is something you want to be really careful about and question yourself because those initial impressions will often turn out to be wrong. But our initial impressions tend to anchor us. So there's a, and one of these cognitive biases is called the anchoring bias, where the first impressions we get about people tend to really stick with us much more than they should. And we don't change our minds about people nearly as often as we should. So for example, if somebody came to meet you and they just had some you know, bad news, maybe, I don't know, their wife was in an accident or something happened, they'll tend to be off. They, they will not have be, be in the right state of mind to have the best conversation with you but you'll read signals from them that suggest that they're anxious, they're worried, you know, that, they're, that you'll be feeling suspicious of them. That's not something that's great. So you want to make sure that you're not holding those initial impressions against them too much, that you're willing to change your mind more quickly than you intuitively feel you should. It's almost like in a networking situation, you do want to find something in common in order to talk to someone about, especially if you're strangers. So you, you kind of do use the halo effect that in that situation, don't you? Yes, absolutely. So you're looking for a commonality and that is a way of influencing the other person. Because of course the halo effect is if you find points of commonality, you're showing them that, hey, I'm part of your tribe, you're part of my tribe, and you are, that's part of social intelligence. How do you use these to influence other people effectively? Right, so. Okay. Can you be more specific about what article in Wikipedia? Uh, yeah, so that's a list of cognitive biases that Stephen po pointed out and shared in the chat. That's the list of the over a hundred cognitive biases. Mm -hmm. yeah, sure we have enough on standby. We're ready. Let's see. There's a question there from Doug. Doug says uh, that I agree that feedback from divergent thinking is important, but it takes confidence in being vulnerable to go there. And this can be seen as weakness. So how do you overcome this? You want to start from the beginning by saying that you will look for other feedback, for divergent feedback. And so this is something that you want to say at the beginning. Before you solicit the feedback, you'll say that this is a way that we want to make sure to have all devil's advocates on the team. We want to make sure to strengthen our ideas by testing them out. And this is something that's really a great technique. I mean, the best leaders get feedback on their ideas from people who disagree with them before sharing them forward, right? And so this is something that you need to have a culture in your team and your organization, create that culture and state out front that this is a technique that we'll be using in order to create better ideas, make sure that we do our best going forward. So that's would be my advice on that front. Mm -hmm. Jean says that she trusts her heart over my head for making decisions. Okay, sorry to hear that. <laughs> well, I get it. It's like, it's, it's not easy to not trust your heart you know yeah, i mean just you're, like it's not the only person you know right sure your your heart your gut your intuition feels a lot like eating those donuts you know <laughs> it, it, it's great you know you sh do you trust it when to do you trust your gut to eat those donuts you know it feels like eating them right it's very intuitive it feels very good it pulls you toward them yes i understand it i mean it it's it's true it, it's something that you feel you feel like you should be doing you feel it's the right thing of course you feel it's the right thing it's wired in you to feel it's the right thing that's how our gut reaction works that's how our heart works our gut reactions our emotions all of that it feels good it feels right that is the feeling that's a very dangerous feeling that is the basis of all discrimination all discrimination is the basis of this feels right you know people don't discriminate because they think I am being an evil person and I'm doing the wrong thing, right? That's not what people feel. They feel that this is the right thing to do. I am discriminating because I feel it's the right thing to do. I feel this is the right thing to do. That's what the heart is about. That's what the gut reaction is about. It gives you, certainly sometimes it feel it, it will take you in the wrong direct, in the right direction, but in many times it will take you in the wrong direction. And that's what we're talking about here. You should never right. simply trust your heart. You should never simply trust your gut. You should always check with your head because sometimes it will be wrong. It will be wrong in systematic ways, in ways that are very bad for our society and for our professional success. 
mm -hmm. our jobs and honestly in our bigger society and civil society. Interesting. Mm -hmm. So Doug cited two books supporting Gleb's thoughts. Yeah, Daniel, Dan Kahneman, Daniel Kahneman's Thinking Fast and Slow, great book, definitely talks about much more in depth about all these cognitive biases. My focus, so Dan Kahneman is kind of the first generation of scholars who look at all of these cognitive biases and how they, what kind of problems they cause. My generation of scholars looks at how to fix them, how to address them, how to solve them. So then, you, so if you want to learn much more about what these cognitive biases are, check out Daniel Kahneman's Thinking Fast and Slow. And so, yeah, that's that's especially good. Mm -hmm. Okay, and Monica says that it'll be helpful for her that she's transitioning to a new a position in her company, uh, and that it will be helpful for her to be mindful and aware. Good. Let's see. Thanks for your comment, Monica. Mm -hmm. uh, Geza asks, what advice do you suggest in interviewing when it comes down to judging how an individual will fit with the organization? Wouldn't that be a tribal decision? It would not be so much of a tribal decision if you ask the same set of questions uh, of all the candidates. So tribalism is a problem when it's about you because you are not going to necessarily represent the culture of your organization. So you wanna be careful about that. You want to ask the same set of questions about people who are coming into the company and making, that are relevant to culture fit within the organization. So I know, for example, I was working with a startup that was asking questions about, let's say work-life balance. And given that it's a startup, you should not expect good work-life balance in the startup but you shouldn't expect high investment and good shareholder value as if you're one of the early employees. So that was one of the questions that was about fit into the company. And that's okay. If you're an established company, then you really wanna prioritize work-life balance because you're not gonna be working startup hours. <laughs> so that's kind of a, an example of a difference for people who are especially younger people who are especially people without families, maybe older people, they'll be fine working in a startup maybe if they're workaholics and that's okay for them and that's fine. And that's kind of a culture question, but other people will not be, I would not be. <laughs> and so that's kind of something that you wanna be thinking about in terms of fit. You wanna ask the same questions of all the people. Okay, so there are some book recommendations, which I'm not going to be commenting about. And Jocelyn said that I don't think that people who eat donuts are following their intuition. They're following <laughs> their gut. That's what their gut tells them to do. You know, it's not, it's not their follow. It's not, they're not thinking with their brain. Aha, I will eat a lot of donuts to gain a lot of weight and make myself obese and, you know, have a heart attack when I'm 40. <laughs> That's not what they're thinking. <laughs> They're not thinking, they're feeling, they're just going with what feels right. Sometimes a good donut does feel pretty darn good though. It to... does. And I'm not saying, you know, it's when you're eating half a dozen donuts. I have nothing and... against a good donut. Yeah, it's, it's when you're eating half a dozen donuts that it's a problem. <laughs> okay. So um, are there any other comments there? I don't see any. Okay, now she well, wants a donut. A donut sure, we'll give you a donut, Monica. <laughs> <laughs> oh, guys, thank you. Uh, Dr. Glenn, you, it was a pleasure. Uh, lots thank of you. learnings here and great takeaways. And thank you for offering such nice resources to share with the team here in the group. We're going to love those, share them back in our companies, and, um, and maybe be better individuals and better teams because of your, your talk to us tonight. So thank, thank you. you. All right, so I turn it back over to my esteemed colleague, Thomas. Bye everyone. <laughs> right. All right, I'm going to take over the share. So does everybody see my screen? Just 